Good morning, people of God in Bayview and beyond in every place of God's creation. Appeal is the Apostle Paul's word for us this morning. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1. And indeed, an appeal by Paul at a critical transitional moment in his writing this letter to Jewish and Gentile Christians in Rome. Paul appealing to Christians whom he has not yet met with the weaving together of theology and ethics in the first 11 chapters of Romans to be one and strong together as disciples of Jesus. Appeal in Paul pouring every part of himself spirit, mind, and body, like as we remember Atticus's Fitch's closing argument appeal to the jury for the innocence of Tom Robinson in Harper Lee's book, To Kill a Mockingbird. Free this man, he's innocent, is Atticus's appeal. And Paul's appeal here in Romans is like his. So, we immerse ourselves deeply now in Paul's appeal. I appeal to you by the mercies of God, writes the Apostle Paul. Yes, God is merciful. God has mercy on us as Paul knew so well from his life and conversion on the Damascus Road. Mercies of God is what Paul holds on to in his centering and building his entire letter to the church at Rome. As Beverly Gavanta, professor of New Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary writes, Paul's appeal in 12.1 to the mercies of God firmly connects the two parts of Romans. The ethical admonitions that follow here in Romans 12 has their have as their motivation neither anticipation of a reward nor fear of punishment, but the mercies of God. That phrase refers back to the whole of Romans chapters 1 to 11. Because of all that, God has already done on behalf of human beings. Paul urges Christians to respond appropriately. Indeed, this is the heart of Paul's appeal. Paul, then here in his appeal, is the master of metaphor. Remembering our high school English teachers, first teaching us about metaphor, we ponder Paul's metaphor here in Romans 12, verse 1. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Yes, this metaphor, giving our bodies or living our lives as a living sacrifice. No question, this is one of Paul's deepest metaphors in all of his epistle writings. Walter Brueggemann, our neighbor in Traverse City, great biblical scholar of the Hebrew scriptures, lecturing here in Bayview in 2011, helps us here. In part, Paul is drawing this sharp and transformative contrast to the sacrificial temple culture of the Greco-Roman world in Greece and in Rome. Even more, Walter Brueggemann agrees with Beverly Gavanta that what Paul really means here is this. Christians living in this alien culture are to give their entire person to Christ as Lord. John Lewis is one who gave his body as a living sacrifice, as a disciple of Jesus, in the ways of Paul's metaphor. May 9th. 1961, 
freedom bus riders, John Lewis and Al Bigelow and others arrive in the Greyhound bus station of Rock Hill, South Carolina. As they come out of the bus to use white only bathrooms, both are assaulted and beaten up severely. One of the young men who punch and kick and beat John Lewis and Albert Bigelow is named Elwin Wilson. 48 years later, in 2009, Elwin Wilson, coming to a whole new understanding of race in America, learns that John Lewis is now a member of Congress. So Elwin Wilson and his son travel to Washington, D.C., to John Lewis's office to ask for his forgiveness. Yes, John Lewis immediately and completely forgives Elwin Wilson. Then this happens in John Lewis's words. Mr. Wilson started crying. His son started crying and I started crying. I believe he was very sincere in his apology. It was the first one I'd ever received from violence committed against me in the civil rights era. It's in keeping with the philosophy of nonviolence. John Lewis adding, that's what the movement was always about, to have the capacity to forgive and to move toward reconciliation. And in that moment, Elwin Wilson and John Lewis now won. The Apostle Paul now builds on this metaphor for all in Rome in mid first century in common era and certainly for all of us in Bayview this August morning that in Christ we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Yes, we are very clear in this COVID-19 pandemic time and are seeking and working together peacefully for racial equality, justice and reconciliation that we cannot transform ourselves. Transformation comes only as we place our hearts, our minds, our full lives in the mind of Jesus Christ, as Paul asserts. Indeed, what comes to us clearly is Paul's words to the Philippians 2.5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is where our transformation comes now for us. Now we return to Walter Brueggemann, our neighbor and friend in Traverse City. Paul in Romans 12 from this beginning in appeal, in metaphor of living sacrifice and in transformation in living ourselves in the mind of Christ. We are, Brueggemann says, fully committing ourselves to the radical reign of Christ where the self is given over to the radical ethic of God's graciousness toward the neighbor. So Paul explodes in ethical transformative words of the way to live each day for all who are disciples of Jesus in this time of 2020. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in the spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, continue, contribute to the needs of the saints and practice hospitality. The Apostle Paul his ethical teaching, Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. Practice hospitality. Well, I have a Bayview story 
to illustrate this. Ruth and Bill Tompkinson and United Methodist Pastor Grace Imathu in the summer of 2016. Pastor Grace, born in Nairobi, Kenya, Africa, nurtured by her father, Bishop of the United Methodist Church in Kenya and her mother, and growing through education and call to ministry to become truly one of the great preachers in the ecumenical worldwide church, especially honored and loved for her gift of African storytelling. Ruth and Bill and Grace meet in a way they go in new friendship in Christ. I smile now asking, guess what Bill and Ruth taught Grace in her baby week with us? Why, of course, lawn bowling. Ruth and Bill, two of our all-time champion lawn bowlers in Bayview history, teaching with kind patience and hospitality, teach great Pastor Grace to lawn bowl. So before her final lecture on Thursday morning in Voorhees Hall, Pastor Grace, wearing one of her African dress hats, says in her gratitude and big smile for being with us in Bayview, I learned to lawn bowl. Thank you, Bill and Ruth. I, from Kenya, Africa, now go home from Bayview to Naperville, Illinois, knowing how to lawn bowl. Yes, in the Apostle Paul's Romans call, be gracious to each other, through life together in Christ. Welcome Grace Imathu, our Kenyan sister in Christ, and teach her to lawn bowl. And in love, welcoming and caring for each other and the new sisters and brothers among us, Paul is even more intentional as he completes his ethical instruction. Bless those who persecute you, Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. John Lewis's life is all about what the Apostle Paul calls us to be and do in Romans 12. Reading and living Romans 12, John Lewis created his own Christ-centered language for us in the 21st century. Good trouble, he called it. Yes, good trouble. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. How clear this is. As we hear John Lewis tell of this experience in his life in October of 2017. I went up to Rochester, New York, and I went to a church that Frederick Douglass had attended, an African-American Methodist church. And let me be sure to call us to remember David Blight coming next summer to Bayview on Frederick Douglass in the American Experience Lecture. So John Lewis here in Rochester, New York, and he comes to a house called the Mother House. And to his great surprise, learns that two of the nuns that took care of him and others who were beaten on the Pettus Bridge in Selma on March 7th, 1965, they had retired and were living in the Mother House in Rochester. Now, after all these years, the two nuns are feeble, up in age, but they recognized me and they called me John. 
and I called them sisters. There were many other nuns sitting around, and they started crying, and I cried with them and hugged them. And they showed me the stained glass window that was taken from the chapel of the hospital in Selma, which is now closed, and they brought it to Rochester. And we stood there and did a song and a hymn, crying and singing, working peacefully for justice in Bayview and everywhere, wherever we are, this is good trouble in Christ. Paul's appeal in Romans 12, forgiving all of ourselves to life together in Christ, an appeal moving us deeply and clearly in Bayview to join John Lewis in acts of good trouble here and at home. Peaceful words, peaceful witness in Christ in Bayview, building a beloved community among us. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Amen and amen.